Hello. This video covers the two broad types of research, major types of journal articles, abstracts, research questions, thesis statements, hypotheses, and how to find citation and reference information on a journal article. When we get to the abstract section, I'll show some concrete examples of journal articles that you can practice along with. So here goes nothing. There are two broad types of research questions that you will come across. Quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative research involves the collection and analysis of numerical data. Numbers. What is the root of quantitative? Quant. In the Latin, quant means amount. So you can think about quantitative research as that which uses and reports numbers, quantities, quantifications. Quantitative research uses statistics to determine causal relationships. Usually, quantitative studies have many variables, which are represented numerically, and researchers try to show relationships between the variables, especially which independent variables cause a change in the dependent variables. Research methods that are usually quantitative include surveys, Think about surveys that you've taken that ask you to circle one through five. Your response is coded numerically. Experiments and various studies using data mining and large amounts of quantitative data that they run statistics on. Quantitative research, like any method, has its pros and cons. Pros include large sample sizes. It's way easier to mail out a survey to 100 people than to interview 100 people, for example. And good generalizability. Cons include providing relatively poor insight into people's lived experiences. Our lives are not reduced to numbers. On the other hand, qualitative research involves the collection and analysis of verbal, textual, and other descriptive data. What is the root of qualitative? Qual. What does qual mean? In the Latin, it means characteristic. So we're not measuring the amounts of things but we're interested in describing the characteristics or qualities of things. What is the essence of the thing we're looking at? Common qualitative methods include observations, interviews, and ethnographies. These allow people to talk and produce in-depth and descriptive information. So for example, imagine that I want to ask you about online learning. My research question is, what do GGC students think about face-to-face -face versus online learning? If I ask you that question in an interview, I'm going to get very different qualitative data compared to if I ask you that question on a survey, like on a scale of one to five, with one being stepping in dog poo and five being I found $50 on the sidewalk, how much do you enjoy online learning? Your response would be a number in the latter case. Now, of course, I could give you a survey with both open-ended qualitative questions and close-ended quantitative questions and get both qualitative and quantitative data. This would be a mixed methods study. You'll likely come across mixed methods studies in the research literature as well. But qualitative studies allow great insight into people's lived experiences while being weaker when it comes to sample sizes and generalizability. When you dig into the academic literature and when you read for class, you will find many types of journal articles. These differ in terms of what kinds of research methods they use, whether they tend to be quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods, and how they are written, the style. The main ones that I'll briefly review are empirical studies, or original research, uh, case studies, literature reviews, theoretical or applied theoretical articles, and methodological articles. Empirical studies, or original research, are probably what you'll see the most, and to me are the most interesting, but all types are interesting in their own way. These are simply reports of original research. Researchers devised the study, collected data, analyzed the data, and reported it. They can use any research method, and papers usually, well, especially in quantitative research, have clearly labeled sections. An introduction, a method section, a results section, and a discussion. If I actually conduct and publish my study on what GGC students think about face-to-face -face versus virtual learning, that would be an empirical study. I devised a study, I collected data, I analyzed it, and I published it. Case studies will almost always be qualitative. These describe and analyze in depth one or two cases or examples of some phenomenon. 
authors select these cases to illustrate a particular problem or solution that the paper addresses. They may use the case to suggest that additional research needs to be done on this problem, because look at how interesting this case is, to demonstrate an application, because look at how well this intervention worked in this case, or to argue that researchers in the field need to think more deeply about the issues associated with this case. For example, if I'm interested in why heroin users overdose, I could select a few cases, or examples, of overdose victims to analyze in my paper. I could compare their histories of drug use, their living conditions, their underlying mental health issues, whatever it's useful to compare this study, to get the reader thinking about the problem of overdosing. I might arrive at a conclusion and be able to argue from my cases that clean needle programs are useful to prevent overdoses. Case studies can be empirical original research, that is, these cases came from the author's own research, or they can use cases that already exist in the literature, which makes them, in some sense, similar to literature reviews, but they're different, as we'll see. Quickly, theoretical articles, or applied theoretical articles, will usually be qualitative. Their goal is to advance a theoretical perspective and often will apply the theoretical perspective using empirical data to demonstrate how it works. Uh, similarly, Methodological articles build upon methods for collecting or analyzing data and include empirical research to demonstrate how the method works. Their goal, and a common goal of theoretical articles, is to make a convincing argument for the utility of the method so that other researchers will build upon it or use it. Finally, literature reviews, which you will come across often as well, literature reviews evaluate the body of research published on a topic. In many ways, they are summaries of what, the other research, of what other researchers have found, which is really useful because there's so much information and research out there on most given topics. So is wine good or bad for you? Well, I bet somebody out there somewhere has done a literature review synthesizing 100 studies on wine and plotting their findings, good or bad. Wine is actually good and bad. It depends on many, many different factors. More research is needed. A more relevant example for today might be a literature review on the effectiveness of certain drugs for treating coronavirus. You can't take any one study alone. You have to look at many studies together. So literature reviews are extremely useful for determining what the whole body of research says as opposed to what just one study found. You want to look at research as a whole, as a conversation that is in progress. Literature reviews are also good for finding gaps in a body of research, for clarifying how a field defines concepts or problems, and making suggestions for future researchers to focus on. For example, I recently read some literature reviews on content analyses of gender representations in video games. They described how content analyses, which is a mixed methods research method, are typically done on gender representations in video games, which variables they tend to focus on, and so they summarize the findings, or the state of the field on this particular issue. Then they said that we, need to, that we know enough about how women are represented in video games, and we need to start doing research examining the effects of these representations. Future content analyses should go beyond just concluding that women are underrepresented or misrepresented in video games, but should focus on the effects on players of such poor representation. As a researcher myself who is doing exactly this kind of work, these literature reviews are extremely useful to me because now I know how my work can be the most useful to the field, to advancing knowledge on this particular question. Literature reviews can be qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative literature reviews are often called syntheses, you'll hear this term, a synthesis of the literature, and quantitative literature reviews are also called meta-analyses, which you will also see when you're doing searches. So now we've gone over some types of journal articles. Now every single journal article that you read has an abstract. And also many academic book chapters have these too. They are at the very beginning. Abstracts are paragraphs that summarize the major aspects of the entire paper. They usually have, they cover the purpose of the paper, provide a little context about the research question or problem, mention the study method, major findings, conclusions, implications, and or recommendations. There's a lot packed into these short paragraphs. Readers should be able to get a clear understanding of what is in the paper from reading the abstract. 
If it sounds like an interesting or useful paper, then the reader will download the paper or acquire it somehow, and they will read more of it for further detail. So when you're reading through the abstract, usually, usually, but not always, now, usually there's some form of a thesis statement, research question, or hypothesis. Though sometimes you'll have to read the introduction or method sections to see these more clearly stated. Every paper has a thesis, even if it's not specifically stated in the paper. A thesis is just an argument. It's the main point you're trying to prove. So a thesis statement clearly and succinctly expresses the main idea or argument of a paper. All papers have a research question, again. This may not be specifically stated in the paper, but the author is always answering a question. Often, you can deduce the question, the research question, from the thesis statement, and vice versa. If my research question is, what do GGC students think about face-to-face -face learning versus virtual learning? Then the thesis statement is the argumentative, generalized form of the answer to that question. I might have found that GGC students overwhelmingly prefer face-to-face -face instruction. That's my finding. My thesis statement, the argument that I'm trying to prove, could be a little bit broader, like, in general, college students prefer face-to-face -face instruction. My data support that assertion. My data support the thesis. Think about it the other way with another example. If my thesis statement is, the foster care system is not working for Georgia's foster care children, then you can figure out what kind of question was likely asked to arrive at that argument. Perhaps it is as straightforward as, how does Georgia's foster care system effectively support children? That question could have been answered differently, but it looks like the data showed that, in fact, the foster care system doesn't do a great job. The rest of that paper would provide data showing me why. Finally, hypotheses are a bit different. You will most often encounter hypotheses in quantitative, especially experimental research papers. A hypothesis is simply a statement that can be proved or disproved. So, let's say I'm doing an experiment and my research question is, does sleep have an effect on the ability to focus on a task? My hypothesis, which I state before I conduct the research, might be, maximum ability to focus on a task is achieved after seven hours of sleep. Note that this can be proven or disproven by my experiment. I might expect to find that this hypothesis is true, so I could create what is called a null hypothesis, N-U-L-L, or a hypothesis that the experiment is designed to disprove. My null hypothesis, which you can often create just by adding not in the hypothesis, could be maximum ability to focus on a task is not achieved after seven hours of sleep. Either my experiment will disprove the null hypothesis, or it won't. Anyway. Let's say that it does disprove it and that our original hypothesis is correct. A hypothesis is not a thesis statement. It's just a research finding right now. We need to generalize it. This thesis statement could be something like, this study demonstrated that sleep has an effect on the ability to focus on a task and that maximum ability to focus on a task is achieved after a specific duration of sleep. Which again, if my hypothesis is correct, then the paper would argue using data uh, the thesis statement. So, let's walk through a couple of examples of abstracts. I'm going to use two articles. Uh, Collins, 2011, on gender roles in media, which I discussed briefly earlier, and Delinsky et al., 2017, on obedience. Go ahead, open these articles up, and pause the video until you have read both abstracts. Okay, um, Collins is first here. Let's go back up. Collins is first. Here's the abstract. Let me make sure that I'm still sharing everything properly. Looks like it, right? Here's the abstract. So here's your first challenge whenever you're reading an abstract, when you're practicing doing this. Close the article. You read it. Close the article and from your memory, explain what it's about. You write it down. Tell somebody nearby, call your grandma, leave a long voicemail to your friend who you had a falling out with years ago. They'll either never speak to you again or the research will reunite you. Wonderful. So pause, do that, and continue. Okay. 
So the abstract is a summary of the whole article, right? So let's see what we can pull from it. Which type of journal article is this? Is it a theoretical piece? Is it a case study? What is it? This is an easy one. The first sentence says that this paper provides a commentary regarding the quantitative content analyses of gender roles in media published in two special issues of Sex Roles. Sex Roles is a journal. So it's a commentary on a bunch of other articles. It's a literature review. It's a literature review of qualitative content analyses, sorry, quantitative content analyses in some recent issues of this journal. You remember what a literature review does? It evaluates the body of literature on a particular topic. So what is the point of this study? It's going to evaluate this literature. It's going to tell us some themes and overarching findings that emerge from the wide variety of data presented from all these studies. It is going to point out some gaps in the literature, important things that these studies haven't considered or areas where they conflict. For example, the abstract notes that studies generally support the same findings about representation in, me about representation in media here about representation of women in media, but it points out that there are moderating factors like race which deserve more attention. Finally, it's going to point out next steps for researchers to consider to do more important content analyses in the future and to push the field forward on this topic or question. For example, the author suggests doing content analyses of new media, user-created media, uh, media created and distributed by users, such as YouTube videos or Twitch streams. The content analyses that the authors reviewed here were probably mostly of mainstream media formats like films or TV shows, and probably not social media or user created stuff. So that's a lot that the abstract here accomplishes. The aim of the study is key findings and conclusions, implications, and recommendations are all stated in this abstract. If this seems useful to the reader, they will download it and read it in full. One more question. Is this a qualitative or quantitative study? Remember, literature reviews can be either. Hopefully you said qualitative. Why? Because this paper provides a commentary. A commentary. They're commenting on, they're talking about, they're discussing the literature. They're not performing any statistical analyses. There's no mention of numbers or numerical data in this entire abstract, except they do point out that the articles they are reviewing are quantitative. So it's a qualitative literature review on quantitative research. No problem. One more question. Do you see a research question, a thesis statement, or a hypothesis? Look around. Well, there's no hypothesis because this isn't an experiment, so we can scratch that one off. Is there a thesis statement or a main argument that this paper is making? This is kind of a tough one. It's not stated super clearly, but the closest thing to a thesis statement is the concluding sentence. This part here. While increasing the representation of women in media may be valuable, it is also critical that the manner in which they are portrayed be simultaneously considered. So all of the research that they review, the findings generally support this point, and this is their kind of conclusion of the argument they're trying to make in their literature review. Now, what about a research question? Do you see a research question in the abstract? This is also a bit difficult. They tricked you here. It's actually in the title. It's pretty clear. Their research question is, is this. The authors set out to answer these questions. What is the state of the literature? on this question, right? Where are we now? And what is the future of research on this question? Where should we go? Okay, not too bad, right? Let's do another one. Delinsky et al, 2017. Let's talk about electric shocks, always fun. Who said research can't be fun? This may require some background knowledge. If you ever encounter a research article that mentions something else, Stanley Milgram, it seems to be central to the to your understanding of the article, go look it up. So if you've never heard of the famous Milgram experiments, do yourself a favor, pause the video, and go read the Wikipedia article, watch a couple videos. 
they're famous, they're fascinating. Go do that. Now that you're back, feeling optimistic about human behavior, right? First question, what type of research article is this? They're really clear. In our experiment, we have expanded it, which is the Milgram or Berger experiments, by controlling for the sex participants and of the learner, the sex of the participants and of, and of the learner. Um, so they conducted empirical research, building on research done by Milgram, Berger, and others on this topic. Was this study quantitative or qualitative? Well, there are several clues that point to it being quantitative, or at least mixed. First, it's a laboratory experiment. Second, they're comparing results to the Milgram experiment, which was largely quantitative. So if you know about the Milgram experiment, you know what this will be like. Third, at the end, they mention hypotheses, which are more closely associated with quantitative and laboratory studies. So probably quantitative. You can scroll through to the methods section to learn more about how they collected data. Um, but what is the point of this study? Well, they're clearly doing a partial replication of the original Milgram experiments and modifying the variables, participant sex specifically, to find out the extent to which people will follow morally questionable instructions from an authority source. They're replicating a study. They're replicating a study means you're doing a study over again, maybe by changing a few variables, but you want to test the findings of some other study or studies. That's what they're doing here. Can you identify a research question, thesis statement, or hypothesis in the abstract? They say at the end that they can't accept or reject the hypotheses. So there are hypotheses, but they're not stated in the abstract. They're probably in the methods section. One sentence approximating a thesis statement is that, where is it? is that a certain picture of the level of obedience uh, can be drawn using the procedure proposed by Berger. So what they're arguing here, uh, essentially, is that they can measure obedience. The researchers are arguing, they're setting out to prove that they can, in fact, measure obedience. They describe the findings which support the thesis statement. The main finding is that the results achieved show a level of obedience toward instructions similarly high to that of the original Milgram studies. They might more clearly rewrite a thesis statement as people today are about as obedient to authority as people in the 1960s when Milgram conducted his experiments. This is a more general argument that is supported by their data, though not totally supported. What are their conclusions? Well, results regarding the influence of sex of participants and of the learner as well as of personality characteristics do not allow us to unequivocally, unequivocally accept or reject the hypotheses offered. That is, they conclude that sex and personality characteristics of the learner don't allow them to absolutely determine the truth of the hypothesis. So in other words, they found some good evidence supporting their thesis, but this topic needs further study. There were some problems. Okay, we've gone over two examples. The last thing that I want to do in this video is to show you how to find reference and citation information in a journal article. I'll use these two as examples. So journal articles typically provide this information on the first page or along a margin somewhere. Looking at Dolinsky et al. here, the electric shock article, the article title is obvious. It's in the top, it's bold, the authors are listed below that, lots of authors. Well, relatively. Uh, a lot of authors is like 20 authors. Sometimes you see way more. So this is relatively few, actually. Look in the upper right-hand corner. You see the journal name, Social, Psychological, and Personality Science, the publication year, 2017, the volume, 8, the issue number, also 8. It's in parentheses after the volume. The page numbers here the page range, and the DOI, which stands for Digital Object Identifier, and is a permanent web address that this article lives at on the internet. That's everything you need to know to correctly reference an article. 
if you use it in a paper. You also see Sage here. What is that? That's the publisher, which you don't care about. If you're citing a book, you do care about the publisher, but if you're citing a journal article, you don't care about the publisher. Don't get the publisher and the journal title confused. That's a common mistake. Learn the names of some of the major academic journal publishers in the social sciences like Sage, Springer, Elsevier, and so on. The journal title is usually something academic sounding or discipline specific, right? Social psychological and personality sciences clearly has to do with social psychology. Um, the publisher sometimes sounds like a medicine, right? Like your skin clear with a selvier or something like that. Note that the journal title sometimes will be abbreviated. If you get a string of abbreviated words that makes no sense, you need to look it up and find the journal's full name. So this one could have been like uh, Soch Psych Per Psy, using the beginnings, the first few letters of each word. You'll see that from time to time. Uh, and you would need to go and find the full name. Don't reference Soch Psych Per Psy. It should be the full journal article, the full journal title. If you scroll through this article, you will see some citation information on the tops of each page. Here's the journal title again, volume. 8, issue 8, Dorinsky et al, which is how you would cite the authors here. If it's not on the top of the article, then it's probably on the tops of the margins or somewhere else on the margins. It might be on the side margin and you'll have to turn your head to read it. Now, look at Collins, 2011. The literature review. The citation information on this one is all on the first page, but it's not quite as neat as this Sage article. You see the title again in huge bold letters, the author just below that. Look up at the top left, you see the journal title, sex roles, the date, the volume number, and the page range and DOI. Here, the volume number is 64. But note there's no issue, right? In the previous one, it was volume eight, issue eight in parentheses. Here you just have volume 64. Oftentimes you won't see an issue. There'll be no number after the volume in parentheses. That might mean that it's issue one or that it hasn't been assigned an issue for whatever reason. In these cases, just cite the volume number, that's fine. Then the page numbers and DOI again. Uh, again, note the publisher down here, Springer Science and Business Media, ignore that. You can also find all of this information online from the journal websites and scholarly databases, but that's a video for another time. So to review, in this video, we've talked about two types of research, quantitative and qualitative, five types of journal articles, and there are more, empirical research, case studies, literature reviews, theoretical or applied theoretical pieces, uh, literature reviews, which I already said, <laughs> methodological articles is the fifth one. We thoroughly reviewed abstracts and we went over how to identify research questions, thesis statements, and literature reviews. I really hope this was useful for you. Give me any feedback that you have on this video and future videos. And until next time, have a great afternoon.